Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Even though I've always been a great Franklin Roosevelt fan, I was more inspired by Eleanor Roosevelt. And now reading the third and last volume of a monumental biography, I can see why I was. My guest is the author, Blanche Wiesen Cook, Distinguished Professor of History and Women's Studies at John Jay College and the CUNY Graduate Center. And I am so happy to have you welcome. Oh, Ronnie, it's so <laughs> great to be here. Yeah. Thank you. I am, um, I mean, I sort of grew up, you know, with Eleanor Roosevelt. And what's so disconcerting, and it made me think really about history and what it is, is that we're talking about the same issues that she's talking about, right? Yes. Race and rescue. Race and rescue. Refugees. The whole thing is amazing. It's amazing. And Eleanor Roosevelt, this book is The War Years and After. It's Eleanor Roosevelt in the fascist era. Yeah. And we are living through what is, I think, a very scary, unknown moment that looks like a fascist coup, yeah. a fascist putsch. And it's unbelievable. But the same opinions about right. refugees. Yeah, right. She was, con I mean, that was one of her major Absolutely. goals was to find places for refugees from the Second World War, right? Absolutely. And finding non-welcoming countries all over the world. All over the world. And now, I mean, she was talking, she really ran with a lot of different groups, the Emergency Rescue Committee, various groups that did kinder transports to bring over children. Yeah. She worked so hard to bring people over. And, you know, FDR State Department was absolutely the blockage. There was a man named Breckenridge Long who just said, delay, delay, delay. We don't want any of them. Um, they'll bring, they'll, they'll cause a revolution they'll be essentially terrorists, they're communists. And the, the disgrace of looking at what was happening in Europe and not letting people in was just unbearable. And she, she was a most persistent person. She was, and she <laughs> never stopped fighting. And right. You know, people don't know about the Varian Fry Rescue Committee, in mm -hmm. which she really worked very hard to make happen. And then they bring in, quote, the best and the brightest, about 1,800 of the most prestigious uh, and published and, you know, stars, Pablo Casals, Hannah Arendt, um, really great notables. And the, the State Department contrives to get Breckenridge Long arrested and silenced and stopped. And that's the end of it after only a year. Um, it's just really quite a nightmare. Mm. Tell, and now there are 65 million refugees from, you know, this planet in trouble. So a lot of it is global warming, yeah. you know, climactic yeah. crises. She, and she was right there with all of them. She was right there. But as a historian, doesn't it depress you? I mean, on the one hand, there's been some progress. On the other hand, it's the same issues. Do you find that as a historian, that's a little depressing? You know, I'm also an activist, as you know. Right. And what I think is Eleanor Roosevelt was right. We have to go, her words, trooping for democracy. <laughs> and we have to build movements. And so Eleanor Roosevelt from the 1920s with her gang of women, and I say never go anywhere without your gang. <laughs> I mean, I grew up in the Bronx. You know, we had... You know, we right. had people who protected us, right. our gang. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, join a movement, build a movement, and go door to door, block by block, community by community, to make our wants and our needs known. And Eleanor Roosevelt went around the country and around the world, never saying, this is what you should do, always saying, tell me, what do you want? Mm. What do you need? Listening. Listening. And, and that's the kind of movement we need. That's the kind of movement we need in, you know, I mean, the Democratic Party. Mm. We need a people's movement. She would be a great new and executive director, wouldn't she? Yes, she would. <laughs> and we, you know, and we need groups of people, and we have them. I mean, you know, Black Lives Matter is building on mm -hmm. the movements that we have. And there's a new group called Surge, um, which is called S-U-R-J standing up for racial justice, a group of white folks 
who, you know, there's something like 900 branches of the Ku Klux Klan right now. We thought that was over, but it isn't over as we know. And Surge wants to exist to push. To push. And that, I think, is one of the most exciting for white people, Surge, standing up for racial justice. justice. Yeah. Um, how and did then you, there's, let me just say, yeah, the CCR, please. the Center for Constitutional right. Rights. Yeah. You know, um, so much is going on. Mm -hmm. The ACLU. Yeah, I yeah, mean, we everybody. just... Everybody. And yeah. look at all these town hall meetings now. But Absolutely. It's, it's fascinating, really, that it's the reverse of the Tea Party. I mean, it's the same technique, but it's... But it's for different movement. goals. Right. Yeah. How did Eleanor Roosevelt become this, uh, I th you have to be passionate about her to have written three volumes, right? Right. How did that happen? How did my writing about yeah. her happen yeah. or how did she become Eleanor Roosevelt? No, ha well both, but let's okay. start with your writing. Um, well, I always say my life was an accident because <laughs> I had an accident when I was a gymnast and I couldn't major in phys ed and do all the things I loved to do most, which was sports and music. and. Um, I was in Abilene, Kansas, and Kate Stimson, lonely in Abilene, Kansas, a dry town, you couldn't even get wine with dinner, would send me books to review. Um, I was working on my Eisenhower book. I was in Abilene, Eisenhower's hometown, to write the declassified Were you teaching Eisen there? No, no, I was, I was researching oh. Um, oh, my you were declassified a, You were already a historian. Book. Right. Yes. Um, and one of the books she sent me was a terrible book about Lorena Hickok and Eleanor Roosevelt written by a woman who couldn't stand the idea that Eleanor Roosevelt had love in her life. And so I reviewed this book um, and I said essentially a cigar may not always be a cigar but the northeast corner of your mouth upon my lips oh. is always the northeast corner. <laughs> and you know, yeah. um, and so people say, well, why don't you write a book about Eleanor Roosevelt? And I said, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> God has forgive me. I said, don't be ridiculous. I'm a military historian. I do hard history. And people convinced me I was wrong. And among the people who convinced me I was wrong was Joe Lash. And Joe Lash was a friend. He had blurred my Crystal Eastman book who is the founder of the ACLU and mm -hmm. the Women's Peace Party, which became the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, um, published by Oxford. He reviewed it saying, essentially, this is a book should, should stay in print forever, mm. and you get to be friends nice. with people who right. blurb your books that way. And so I called him up and I said, what's up with you not having Hick in your books at all? And he said, well, I hated her, but let's have dinner. So we had dinner, and Joe explained that um, Hick was a bit of a bigot. Um, she wasn't much interested in refugees, and you know they just didn't like each other. And he, he said he hated her. His <laughs> wife, Tuda Pratt, who's a, mm -hmm. a hero in this book, because she's really responsible mm -hmm. for the Varian Fry Rescue Committee. Her name was Gertrude von Adam Wenzel. Pratt Lash, <laughs> and she is a most amazing woman who um, was part of the German underground. Um, the and she she had a PhD from the University of Freiburg in 1931. Came to the U.S., taught at Hunter College, then um, went back to Germany to run an anti-Nazi paper in 1932. And Elliot Pratt, who had fallen in love with her, followed her. They got married. But when Hitler came to power, her newspaper was destroyed. Her editors were assassinated by the Nazis. Mm. They came back here. And then it's, a, mm. it's part of the book. Yeah, it's a great anyway, story. so Joe said, you do it. And I said to Joe, don't be ridiculous, <laughs> OK? He said, no, you're really wrong. And he took me up to Hyde Park. And we went through the archives mm. together, and I saw that there was a bit of a story. This is 1982, just as my Eisenhower mm. book had come out. And um, because Joe was the favored son, the good son, anything Eleanor Roosevelt said, he said anything. She didn't want him to deal with. He didn't deal with. <laughs> she said, I don't care about power. He wrote she didn't care about. So I knew I had a story, and I thought I could finish it by the centennial. 1984 of her birth. Um, that was my yeah. goal, but of course I didn't do that. 
I am now finished, however. <laughs> and, the, and the thing is that Eleanor Roosevelt is truly amazing. And she never stopped growing and changing. She never stopped confronting the powerful crises that befell her. And one part of your question, I thought, was how did she get that way? Mm -hmm. And it really is she identified with people in want, in need, in trouble. People just like her own family. Her father was an alcoholic who died at the age of 34. So it didn't much matter that her uncle was Theodore Roosevelt, the president, or that she was born to a certain amount of wealth and privilege. Imagine what life we know, that alcoholism is a family disease, and her mother died when she was eight, essentially turned her face to the wall. Her father died when she was 10. And Eleanor Roosevelt's childhood of grief and loneliness um, was changed when she went off to um, this great school in England, um, Allenswood, and met her mentor, Marie Suvest, and nobody has still written a biography of Marie oh, Suvest. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, which needs to be done. And that ch changed Eleanor Roosevelt's life. And, and she, before she, she married Franklin, and how old? She, she met him when she was 18. Um, I guess she was 20, 18 or 19. And was that a real love affair? Um, yes, they did. They fell in love. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were fifth cousins, mm -hmm. once removed, um, so her name was Eleanor Roosevelt Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really, and, and she thought it was forever. Yeah, um, we know. And we know the, he didn't. Did yeah. she have a sense of humor? She did have a sense of humor. She liked to tell jokes. She liked to be, she liked to be an amusing company. Um, yeah. One of her surprising friends was John Golden, who was the great Broadway producer mm -hmm. who took her to the theater all the time. She loved theater. She loved music. Um, I discovered recently through her um, great-grandchildren that she loved listening to Gregorian chants. Oh, interesting. She'd wait for her <laughs> children and to grandchildren her voice. <laughs> to come home, and she would listen to Gregorian so chants. When, when did... FDR become governor? 19. So how old was she about then? Oh, she was in her 30s. 30s. Yeah. So that she always had that ability. Right. I mean, not always, but she had, was given the opportunity to do the kinds of things she wanted, in a way, because her husband was a person of power. Well, but she really is... She was her own person. She was her own and person was, and encouraged yeah. him yeah. to Absolutely. run for office right. and made, you know, created right. networks of power that yeah. supported him. She was so interesting because she's a combination of passion and political. She was very political, right? right? And a pragmatist in a way because when she was very obviously devoted to him because right. when he didn't want her to do something that she really believed in, she didn't do it. Right. Well, he she found other ways. She, she yeah. yeah. I mean, he really did silence her on occasion. Yeah. And um, she always believed that they shared a vision. She tr no, I, I write that she was his goad and he was her barometer. It's interesting. You know, and we're looking at, and we can really understand this when yeah. you look at the current situation yeah. that we're in. Right. He was facing a Dixiecrat-dominated mm -hmm. Congress. I mean, the Southern Democrats, this is, you know, the yeah. 1930s yeah. and 40s. And what he wanted was he wanted to d get America's defenses funded. Right. And he wasn't going to risk issues of race and rescue and alienate those right-wing Southern Democrats who he depended on for what he thought was the bigger picture, um, yeah. the New Deal and funding for mm -hmm. defense. I had, it's so interesting because I was young and I, what I loved about her, she had a great influence in my life in a funny way, with that high voice. It made her, in a way, non-professional. Do you know what I mean? And I would see her addressing pictures of her with large groups of men, whether the unions or this or that. And I thought, she must be nervous. <laughs> and her voice must be trembling from nerves. But she has the courage to go out and do that. But I don't think she was nervous when I read the book. No. 
<laughs> well, she always said, courage can be as contagious as fear. <laughs> and that was really yeah. her goal, was yeah. not to be nervous, right. was to confront yeah. reality and confront, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. Well, it, you right. know, it that came was from her inside. inside. And she and, was just driven by and it. And she was driven by it. And I have to say, when you think about her network of women support, like there's a woman named Esther Lape, L-A-P-E, who really was her closest friend and mentor politically. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, I've been teaching for many years at the Graduate Center. I've told all my graduate students to write a biography of Esther Lape, and nobody has to this day. I can't believe it, because she was a great visionary. And Eleanor Roosevelt and Esther Lape fought for what we would today call a single-payer national health care plan, which was supposed to be in the 1935 Social Security Act and the AMA lobbied it to death, and it didn't get in. Then it was supposed to be Eisenhower in 1957. He did a Health Reinsurance Act, and Esther Lape, and he, he actually called on Eleanor Roosevelt to help him get it passed with Esther Lape, and he gave the pen he signed it with, which was the first really big, along with the Civil Rights Act of 1957, big contributions by Eisenhower. He gave the pen he signed it with to Esther Lape, who waved it uh. to the press and said, now this represents a puny little bone <laughs> in the vertebrae <laughs> of what I had in mind. And we still don't have what most of uh, right. you know, the industrial world And now world we're arguing about it. Yeah. Right, and now it's going to be defunded even How did she crazy. meet Esther Lape? Um, what was Esther Lape's background? Esther Lape was, uh, she taught at Barnard. She was a scholar. Um, she had a partner named Elizabeth Reed, who became Eleanor Roosevelt's financial advisor and attorney. Um, and they were, you know, club women, mm. cosmopolitan club. Mm. And Eleanor Roosevelt joined their group, and mm. that their group became, uh, you know, the Professional Democratic Women's Committee. Yeah, right. So they really, they're the folks who went door to door, but they also wrote incredible you know, pamphlets yeah. and organized and, and met pushed. and, yeah, pushed. Uh, she was not, was she not friendly with Frances Perkins? She, they, <laughs> she was, she admired Frances Perkins. Um, Were they the same age or Frances was basi basically, basically, basically the same, same. age? Um, she admired Frances Perkins, but they weren't particularly mm. um, friendly. Mm. Perkins carried on, did some of those programs that she yes. really. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It was something. Um, I met her, Eleanor Roosevelt, because I was what you call a youth builder in my junior high school with oh, my great. wonderful civics teacher, civics, which is not taught enough these days, right? Right. Uh, Herbert Eben. And um, it was very, it was really wonderful. And she just talks to you. you know, I mean, it was really She's very dignified, but it was also warm and, res and respectful. Right, and she looks right at you. And she didn't talk down Unpack to your you. heart. Right. Yeah. But she had that thing about civics and the importance of community and participating in the community, which is what we be Absolutely. now, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I met her as well. I invited her when I was student body president, mm -hmm. uh, student council president at Hunter College in 1961. I invited her to come speak. And she did at yeah. Roosevelt House and electrified the room. Yeah. It was 1961. And she said, many wonderful things are happening <laughs> in the South. Go South for freedom. Oh. And we took two buses and went to That's North so Carolina because of Eleanor Roosevelt. Did she wear a hat then? She did. She wore a hat. She wore gloves. Um, it was interesting also in the book because her mother always said she was ugly, right? right. So... But then later on, when you quoted different things, they said she looked beautiful, she had this beautiful dress on, she had this and that. How right. did that come together with her? Well, she really was startling. And, and because she, you know, she had this great emotional vitality, mm. she embraced the people she was speaking with. And she was very beautiful and startling, six foot tall, very thin. She was an athlete. She rode every yes, day. She, she swam amazing. every day. She began the day, you know, doing calisthenics to the radio. 
Um, she was amazing and she was in terrific shape. Also, she cared a lot about um, her costumes. Yeah. And, um, you know, That's had a, a, yeah. yeah, people don't realize right. they had a designer. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating, isn't it? It is, yeah. Because you don't put that together. And she was very together. social. She had great social things going on in the White House. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, integrated the White House. Mary McLeod Bethune came mm -hmm. for dinner. Mm -hmm. um, Walter White came for dinner. Um, she really did integrate as much as, as and, she could. There's a a scene when she goes around the, really, she goes around the world during World War II, and she's in the South Pacific visiting because, imagine, the military, the U.S. military is still segregated, mm. but she goes to all of the black um, bases as well as the white bases, and in one there's a, you know, a kind of club, and there's a black soldier eating an ice cream cone. And she goes over to him and she says, may I have a bite of your ice cream cone? I, that was and a wonderful story. It's an amazing moment yeah. and she bites it and right. she says, no, that didn't hurt at all, did it? <laughs> <laughs> and the press is there. And Marian Anderson and all of that kind of stuff. So Absolutely. she was very much there. People hated her also though, some people. Well, I mean. It was vicious. It was vicious. And there's, I mean, John Edgar Comey, I mean, John Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, one of the largest, I got her FBI file through the Freedom of Information Act. It is one of the largest in the United States. It's thousands and thousands of pages. Everything she says against segregation, everything she says against lynching, everything she says for racial justice is about 80% of her file. And that's what's, quote, un-American in Hoover's mm. fantasy. And then, <laughs> of course, that is communist. Right. To be for to, for, against segregation means you must be a communist. We were so and afraid that, of everybody. Right. Then. And that's the history of this fascist moment, he showed, which doesn't, I mean, everybody sorry. needs still, to see yeah, 13. Right. He, you know, he showed it to Franklin, right, the file? Right. And Franklin laughed, didn't he, or what? Well, um, <laughs> it's very interesting to me that Franklin does not fire J. Edgar Hoover, mm. and he does not fire Breckinridge Long. And Hoover does show him lots of the files. We also know that Hoover um, bugged her bed, you know, when she's traveling, and there's this nonsense about she's in bed with mm. Joe Lash, which is insane. But did FDR know that Hoover was going to bug her phones yeah, and her beds? Yeah. I mean, yeah. what's going on here? And it raises that question. Yeah. Right. Um, but what do you think she said to him when he died and she asked to have the coffin opened and she went in there by herself for a few minutes? Well, I think what um, we know is that she put her ring, mm -hmm. she took her ring off. And it was over because she had found out mm. that Lucy Mercer was with him mm. when he um, died. Yeah. died. And so that moment, because there was a guard who witnessed it, and she took her ring off. But she never spoke of it. Mm. She never told even Joe Lash what was going on. And she, def you know, mm -hmm. she always said mm -hmm. she didn't do anything mm -hmm. by herself. It was all Franklin that went at the United Nations. What she was doing for human rights was she was fulfilling Franklin's legacy. She didn't take credit yeah. for the input um, of her own really incredible vision. And now, activism. it couldn't have all been uh, the perf her mentor, the French person. Marie Suvest. Yeah that made her what she was. Are people born, do you think when you, as a historian, are people born with a certain drive? How does that come about? Well, I think it needs to be encouraged. And her mentor, Marie Suvest, recognized that Eleanor Roosevelt was a leader. She became an immediate leader at this school. Mm -hmm. And she, she wrote when she was 76, she wrote, the happiest day of my life is the day I made the first team at field hockey. And that for me was so important because not only was she a leader 
and a writer, and Marie Suvest was very impressed by her independent thinking and the vigor of her, you know, mm. imagination and how she wrote so clearly, um, and in French. I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt was very multilingual, yeah. um, and that's before Marie Suvest. I mean, she had French tutors and she spoke German fluently, um, but but so that. She, but she made the first team at field hockey, and that was the happiest day of her life. Meant to me she was also competitive, and she liked sweaty knockabout sports, which I think yeah. is very important yeah. to know about her. Yeah, it was really something. So what, how do, do, do young people, they don't really know about her? Well, they are, I'm, I'm getting a lot of mail from people saying this book is giving us hope. Mm. And I think this book gives hope because Eleanor Roosevelt said, we, first of all, she, she has a line about how we are so selfish and greedy. We have to realize it's not about making money and becoming greedy and mm. in charge. It's about helping each other. It's, be out, it's about creating a decent society. And, Which is and that's what we and need that's today. Right. And, and, it, and we're, before we're, Bernie Sanders, if I can just say, yeah. Eleanor Roosevelt said, what we need is free, public, excellent, quality education for everybody. We will all go ahead together or we will all go down together. together. She said that in 1934. In 1943, she said, we should have free, public, higher education, college for everybody without tuition. I just want to say the book is also very exciting to read. I mean, I couldn't wait to pick it, get back to reading it each day. So thank you so much, Blanche Cook. Thank and you, Ronnie. It's you, a Ronnie. great contribution to our lives. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We at CUNY TV always like to hear from our viewers. So if you have any subjects you'd like to explore or people you'd like to hear, please let us know. Write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or go to our website, cuny.tv, and click on Contact Us. We look forward to hearing from you.